O Lord of hosts, be with us, for we have none other help in times of adversity but Thee. O Lord of hosts, have mercy on us. And when you begin to look at some of the ancient gods, I don't believe any ancient pagan god embodies the values and the sentiments of contemporary modernity or the information age like the Greek Hermes. Why do I say that? Well, let me just list you some of the attributes that Hermes is associated with. Number one, he's the god of boundaries. How many times have I gone on here and talked about the dissolution of boundaries? We can look at the androgyny, of which Hermes, ironically, is androgynous, typifying his sort of um, transgression or ability to be on both sides of a boundary. So he's both male and female. He's sort of hermaphroditic. In fact, where we get Herm from hermaphrodite comes from the son of Hermes who is called hermaphroditus. So hermaphroditic tendencies, again, this is, comes from the hermaphroditus, the son of Hermes, the god of boundaries. Everything we look at the world right now is a sort of attack on the boundaries. And, and boundaries themselves, as I've talked about, at least from a traditional Christian perspective, are maintained by the masculine presence, by men, by masculine traditional men, and so as we see the eroding and the degradation of Western society, we see also the attack on masculinity, the loss of tradition, and therefore the dissolution of boundaries. And I've talked about how psychedelics, uh, drugs generally speaking, but psychedelics specifically, phenomenologically, experientially dissolve these boundaries. And I think this is a sort of preemptive catalyst for people to adopting relativistic worldviews because they essentially just believe whatever their personal experience is. And so Hermes is the god of boundaries. So interesting, right? The god of boundaries. And I think this is going to be really useful to understand in regards that Hermes is not good or evil, right? Hermes uh, is not a sort of uh, satanic figure per se. Now, obviously, we would say he's a Luciferian figure. You say he's a sort of Promethean figure and some of these other things that we'll get into. But my point in saying he's not good or evil is not talking from a Christian perspective. Of course, paganism isn't consistent with our own worldview. What I'm meaning is he's not good or evil in the sense that he is a trickster figure. He's not, it's, it's his own volition. It's his own will, right? Some of the things, and let me get into more of these attributes, right? Hermes is the god of road, roads and travelers. So international trade, international uh, uh, travel, right? Those who are on the move. He's the god of thieves. He's the god of shepherds. He's the god of athletes. He's the god of commerce. He's the god of speed. He's the god of writing, the god of science, the god of magic, the god of techne, technology itself. He's a magical god. He is a trickster god. He's the god of communication, and he's an androgynous god. So let's again work through some of these attributes to see again how they match up with our current state of the world. The god of boundaries, as I said, we don't need national boundaries are on the attack. Gender boundaries are on the attack. Personal boundary, boundaries between your body and the state, we saw under attack in 2020, 2021, and still to some degree under 2022. I mean, people who are still getting boosters, there's really no help for them. You know, people who aren't awake yet um, are sort of already in their alternate reality. But roads and travelers, why is that related to con the contemporary period? Well, what point in history what, is there more of an opportunity to travel? What point in history is there more of an opportunity to use roads to move from place to place? You can look at, uh, you know, yeah, we can point to the sort of uh, the, the, the transportation systems developed by the Nazis, which then is our sort of contemporary highway system in the United States. Um, but no point in history were the roads and travel as accessible and easy as it is right now. Again, and, and Hermes is the god of roads and travelers. Thieves. Hermes is the god of thieves. Does thievery resonate at all in our contemporary period? Well, I think uh, absolutely so. Of course, we're in the midst of a great reset, which it itself is a sort of thievery in regards to the consolidation of wealth into smaller and smaller and fewer hands. 
We could look at the Federal Reserve and a little thing called Jekyll Island and the U.S. promissory notes that we use as our currency because obviously it's not backed by gold anymore. That, I would argue, is a form of thievery. We can look at, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> contemporary divorce courts. I've talked about how men have no leverage, in, depending on what state you're in. But uh, in a way, their kids can be stolen from them by the state, or at least siding with an angry wife, uh, which sort of steals the family away. We can look at, um, you know, uh, so many aspects of our, of our world today. It, it's, it, it's about theft. And the powers that be are constantly thieving and stealing from those below. And so, and at the same time, as we see the 21st century crime continue to get worse and worse, it's not like our cities are becoming more of a trust society, right? More of a, an unknown, you know, we're not becoming more homogenous and, mo and more consolidated. No, we're becoming more separate. Crime is on the rise. Personal thievery is on the rise. So not just now, you know, the sort of institutional thievery that we're seeing um, or the, the inflation. This is another form of, uh, of thievery. We're seeing the, the deliberate collapse of the Western world, uh, the money laundering operation known as the Ukraine-Russian war, um, that all this is aiding in the, in, the, in the inflationary process, which is, again, thieving wealth from us. And if you have enough of it, doesn't matter if they cut the wealth in half or the value of money in half, because those at the top, if they especially have real assets, it doesn't really matter. And so theft, I couldn't think of a point in which it really, the world is in more of a theft or a thievery type state. Guys, smash that like for everybody who's here. Please smash that like. I hope you guys like uh, tonight's stream. So thieves, thieves are certainly empowered in the contemporary world. What about, uh, again, hackers, um, people who thieve through, again, the electronics, the digital technologies, which is really communication technologies and digital technologies is real. I really want to hone in, again, this information age, why this age is unique and why then this stuff connects with Hermes. So the next one is shepherds. Now... I'm not going to get too deep into how Hermes relates to shepherds and that's our contemporary life, but I do want to make a point as we dive deeper in here in regards to the uh, origination of writing, the alphabet, language, and stuff like that, that I think we're also going to see a sort of contention between Logos and Hermes, Christ and Hermes. And we're going to see this in regards to the word or to language and also to the development of scripture, the book, the Bible, um, reading itself, writing systems. And so I can't help but think how Hermes also um, sort of fulfills that, that progressive, Gnostic, uh, magical sort of Christ consciousness. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, Hermes is androgynous. How many people want to talk about Christ as being androgynous? Um, he's a sort of god of magic. How many people want to talk about Christ being a magician, right? Here's one of the famous books doing that, Jesus the Magician by the homosexual Morton Smith. Um, so uh, often, you know, language, logos, writing, all this different stuff, communication, uh, there's some uh, God of boundaries. Logos, of course, creates boundaries. Hermes is noted for his ability to transgress boundaries. And that's why Hermes is a psychopomp. Hermes aids the soul in their journey from life to death. In some places, uh, is part of the sort of judgment. Uh, he's the sort of secretary of the gods in the Greco contents. Um, so I think uh, this sort of judging figure, this sort of psychopomp, we see some similarities with Logos or how we understand Christ. And I'm going to dive deeper into how I believe the war, this information age war, and, and again, where his sort of uh, powers that be are actually in a sort of realm that is bootstrapped in regards to the ability to use language and writing particularly, that our minds actually move into a realm that is at a higher order than that of the... Um, uh, the illiterate tribes that read nature, right? That walk past a rock and hear the rock speak to them. 
that language and the alphabet and writing lifts us, it bootstraps us, our minds, our cognition out of that natural world and where we are animistic in that we read nature. And you can see then the blending into sort of hieroglyphics with the Egyptian that still have one foot in the animistic world and one foot in the linguistic world. Same thing with China. But the Phoenicians develop a unique technology called the alphabet. And of course, the Phoenicians um, also rub, rub off on the Hebrews, and we see the use of an alphabet then in the Old Testament. But it isn't until the Greek language that vowels are introduced. So the completion of the technology of writing of the alphabet is fulfilled in the Greek language, which is ironic then that the New Testament uses Greek to express the revelation and the incarnation of the Logos itself, the Word of God. And so it's this higher order realm in which we're starting to deal with logic and semiotics. And this is why Plato is unique. Plato's the first philosopher in Greece to sort of, uh, his mind is lifted out of that order. And he then is working in the realm of language. And I think that's tied even to his then adoption of the ideal forms. Because the alphabet itself provides a sort of precondition for the concept of an ideal form. The, the completed alphabet itself is sort of a, a circular form. It's a perfect form itself. And then words are sort of uh, pieces of, right? So anyways, Hermes is the god of athletes. We live in a time in which men, particularly, we are inundated with sports and, and trivial aspects of uh, male accomplishments to sort of deprive us of our true curiosity of sort of knowing the world. So today is Saturday. Soon we'll be entering in the fall. And I, I will confess, I like watching football. I like college sports. But Soon, Saturday and Sundays, as, as we move into the fall period, is just going to be dominated by not day streaming, but day drinking at various football games um, in a sort of over uh, obsessive, uh, an over obsessiveness with like team sports and teams. And so Hermes is the god of athletes. And at the same time, in the 21st century, you know, look how much athletes are getting paid. You know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with what's going on in the NFL, but Deshaun Watson, a gentleman who just got hired or traded to the Cleveland Browns, hasn't played in over a year, made $10 million last year for not playing, just signed a contract to 200 some million dollars of guaranteed money. Meanwhile, he can't even play football because he has a problem with hiring 60 some massage therapists and having 40 some cases of sexual assault. So we see then Deshaun Watson, um, you know, uh, contributing to the sort of uh, you know very weird behavior in regards to his massage ther therapist, massage therapist. I digress, though. The point being is the dude who just committed that hadn't played football in two years, just signed some of the, one of the biggest contracts in NFL history by the Cleveland Browns, $200 million to play football, and he hasn't played in two years, and he can't play for the first 11 games this season due to his behavior. And so, again... Hermes comes to the fore. Who else would we pray to or that the pagans pray to on behalf of athletes other than Hermes? And so this comes next to commerce. We're living in a world that's totally dominated. You know, let's give the credit to those who criticize capitalism. You know, uh, anybody who's played Monopoly knows that capitalism ends in the same state that socialism and communism begins. The sort of centralized effort. Yes, it may be private monopolization, but it's still the monopoly of power itself. Uh, the sort of Adam Smith, you know, guarantees of the free market. It's an idealistic, utopian concept that really doesn't play itself out in the real world to some degree. We see the continual monopolization of everything. And so that has led then to, uh, again, as Christians, we believe the whole world's moving towards a sort of one world government figure. And so commerce, corporations, corpses, right, these sort of dead bodies that we call corporations, these corpses sort of run our society. 
right? And they're given the rights as if they're a human living entity, just none of the responsibilities. So they can't be arrested. They can't go to prison, all this stuff. They're sort of uh, given all the benefits, but not all the um, responsibilities of being a person, these corporations. And we see how the corporations, again, we're in the midst of the Great Reset, are absolute catalysts to this consolidation of power in our own imprisonment. And so again, Hermes is the god of commerce. And, and, and it's through the commerce that we both feel like we're sort of free, but at the same time, we're also imprisoning ourselves. And this sort of habitual consumerism is the loss of sort of individuality and uniqueness and awareness. And that's where the, this problem we saw with the BLM, with 2020, we saw how people's consumeristic habits and the corporations then coming out with political ideologies and propaganda influences people's own personal opinions. Because we're in a state now where tradition's been eroded, religion's been eroded, ultimate authority's been eroded. So what do people uh, depend on? Well, my own personal opinion, my own belief, my own experience, and therefore uh, my own hedonism. And that leads into my own consumerism. So the corporations and the goods that I consume and now Supreme and Nike and and whoever, uh, Harley Davidson, it doesn't matter what it is. Now they're all supporting BLM or whatever it is. Commerce then, again, the god of commerce is Hermes. We are living in the most commercial time in history. There's never been a more commercial time in history than right now. Speed, the speed of communication. When we look at the uh, depictions of Hermes or Mercury, it, he, has, he has wings. Hermes has wings on his helmet. Mercury has wings on his sandals. But we see this like with Sprint. If you look up the, 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 um, the symbolism of, of Sprint, the way at least it uh, used to look, it was a wing. Why? Because the wing is the wing on the foot of Hermes, the, the god of communication, the god of messages, the god of writing. And so Sprint, as a telephone company, a company tapping into the sort of electronic world to send messages to people, to communicate, they appropriated the symbolism of Hermes himself with the, with the wing. With, with. So speed. We have never existed at a point in which the communicative speed of the world is absolutely uh, phenomenal right now. Now, of course, now we're surrounded with, uh, with uh, orbiting 5G satellites. And so these 5G satellites then create the environment for instantaneous communication across the world, across the world. And so speed then, that's why we look at 2020 and the propaganda that, that and why it was so efficacious is because through the digital communicative technologies, which again are indicative of the information age, Hermes, Mercury, Thoth of the Egyptian context um, is... Um, is, is, uh, is providing that instantaneous communication across the world. As, but as Marshall McLuhan said, these digital technologies then begin to affect us. And this is where sort of the trickery comes from, because Hermes is a trickster figure, is that, uh, as we've talked about, these technologies are extensions of ourselves. And every time we adopt a technology, doesn't matter if it's a hammer or it's the personal uh, iPhone, that they change us to some degree. That man is like homo sapien, is like homo or tool, right? It's like we are defined by our tools. Language is a tool. Writing is a tool. But tools themselves then come to define us because we as a species extend ourselves out into the world through our tools. But as Marshall McLuhan talks about, all these tools both give and take away. They both provide an opportunity and atrophy your, your innate skills. And so this is why, as we'll look at, Socrates was worried about writing. Well, Socrates didn't write anything down. Socrates believed that writing things down using the alphabet, using, again, these linguistic writing technologies, would atrophy the human mind, memory, and the ability to orate. And as we now look in the 21st century, he's, he was right. These, ad, these technologies at the same time are atrophying our natural abilities, 
uh, while providing sort of uh, other opportunities. And I've talked about MapQuest, for example, the sense of direction people have. People don't have a sense of direction because they're always using their phone to give them directions. And this was an important thing for a man. A man should be able to know where north is. You know, you should be able to put him somewhere and he'll be able to figure out which, which direction's north, where to go, how to navigate. Um, and so we're losing a lot of these innate abilities due to the speed of these new technologies. And so, again, at no point has the speed of communication been as fast as it is now. And this is indicative, again, of us living in the age of Hermes, the information age. And so another attribute is writing in hieroglyphs. As we'll talk about, uh, there's a whole mentioning of, um, of Thoth, Hermes, and the Picatrix. There's an example of Socrates talking about Thoth and the, in, in the, 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 the desire to introduce writing to the Egyptian people. Writing is a major, major thing. This is a difficult one for us to really wrap our minds around, is that we exist in the mind, the, the sort of bootstrap, the higher order of being that is innate to people who can read and write. Most people in history, again, the illiterate people, um, they read nature. They did not read and write. And so there's a book by David Andrews called The Spell of the Sensuous. And again, he's an advocate of psychedelics and all this stuff. He's a phenomenologist. But his book is really interesting because it shows how Native American tribes, specifically in Alaska, they have developed languages that are very old. These are native peoples, illiterate peoples. They don't have writing technologies. And so their language, they believe that they communicate with a sort of tribal bird. I think it's like the cuckoo bird or something like this. And so they, when they hear that bird sing its songs, to them, those are words in their own language. And so for, for these particular Native Americans in Alaska, they then view nature as a sort of book. Now, they wouldn't say it that way because the book doesn't exist to them. Writing technologies don't exist to them. However, they read nature. And nature then comes at them. And so all the animals, all the plants, all the rocks have a voice. They speak to them. They're constantly in communication with the natural world. This is the sort of animistic mind. This is the primitive man. And so it's through then the entrance of writing that man was lifted out. And this was across cultures. Again, we can point to the Phoenicians with the sort of introduction of the alphabet. And the Hebrews adopted it. But the Hebrews didn't have vowels. It wasn't until the Greek language adopted vowels that the sort of technology of the alphabet was complete because there was other people developing writing technologies like I pointed to the ancient Chinese and the Egyptians who used more of a pictorial glyph because they had still one leg in the animistic world so the writing technologies mimic the sort of visual cues of the world that's why they use hieroglyphs or why they use Chinese pictorial graph characters because the graph, the glyphs themselves represent the visual stimuli of nature. This is very different from the alphabet. The alphabet is a, a contained system. In a way, the alphabet doesn't change. This is what's really interesting and this is where I think the theology of the logos and all this stuff really enters because when you think about language, you know, the map is not the territory. Lang the words are not the same thing as the reality itself. But at the same time, which one's more important and which one's more primary? And so for Plato and some of these Greeks, they began to think, well, geez, language, the alphabet almost exists in like the realm of the ideal forms. It doesn't change, right? The way we use the alphabet, the way we use language, the things we talk about, those things are co maybe constantly changing, but the sort of linguistic structure itself, the language, the alphabet itself is like a technology that's, uh, that's divorced from the sort of the evolution or the, the constant flow and change of time. And this is where I think that's because it's logos, it's the Alpha and the Omega. That is Christ. Christ, through language, through the word, through writing the words, lifts us out of that animistic reality, lifts us out of that animistic mode of being and brings us into this higher order. Now, you look across these pagan cultures and they tend to have linguistic communicative deities. And so this is where Hermes then I think is really interesting because you have all these narratives of Thoth introducing writing to the Egyptians. 
And Thoth is just the Egyptian uh, version, which then gets transmutated into Hermes in the Greek and Mercury in the Roman. And then later you have Hermes Trismegistus, which is a sort of amalgamation of all three into now a historical person. Of course, the, the person Hermes Trismegistus never existed, but he is the sort of amalgam. He's the he's the archetypal amalgamation of Thoth. Hermes and Mercury, all the same sort of messenger, linguistic, magical deities, magical deities. And so it's hard for us to really appreciate the development of alphabets and language in the ancient world. This is ginormous and this is a technology. This is the extension of man. Now, I perceive this again as logos. This is Christ. This is God. This is the word of God literally building that bridge. Like it's by us adopting language. We sort of, again, bootstrap ourselves into a higher order. That is God like coming down and lending a hand and pulling us out of that animistic, more irrational realm so that we can begin to engage in mathematics and logic and all this stuff. And that's why Plato is the first Greek philosopher to really adopt that language. And I think his philosophies of the ideal forms and stuff like that is totally in step with and consistent, I think, with the presuppositions of his use of the alphabet and written language itself. And I think that's a really underestimated, uh, underestimated attribute of, alpha, of, of the alphabet. And I think we as modern people are just so... Um, uh, uh, so we, we just do not appreciate, we do not appreciate language and the role of language because that's going to, that's again, the digital technologies. I argue again, it's this higher realm that I argue the logos, the word itself. But again, from, from the Greek, her, 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 you know, uh, pagan perspective, it's Hermes that brings us into the sort of writing linguistic realm. And here is all the semiotic processes. Right? Doesn't matter if we're talking about magic, doesn't matter if we're talking about mythology or archetypes or mathematics or science. They're all semiotics. They're all symbol systems. We couldn't exist in that symbolic system realm without the use of the alphabet, without writing. And so there then is the real battle. And it's these communication technologies then where we're all being manipulated by the symbols. And that's why, as we, I believe, when we follow the logos, when we follow Christ, we're given true symbols. We're, we're, we're able to understand and decipher the symbols more accurately. And then we become more uh, sort of immune to the magic, because there is real sorcery and magic going on here, to the use of other words. And, and I've said this before about spells. Aleister Crowley talked about spells. Spells just mean to spell a word and this was never more evident than in ancient Egypt again that e that Egyptian culture especially when they were developing the hieroglyphics again which they claim came from Thoth that one foot in the animistic realm one foot now into this higher order of language this new semiotic perception of, of man's mind um, that this uh, this, this is a sort of higher order phenomenon, and this is where the world is happening. And I totally agree then with Prescott when he says we're going back to hieroglyphics with the emojis. Absolutely, because language, we can't think without the words we use. And that's why reading is a development. That's why it's so strange, right? Why is it that when we read books, it's like ourselves are extended, like we literally become more of who we are? Because somehow there is a, there is a very dynamic and interesting process when humans read books read words again this higher order phenomenon that um you know it, 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 the mental images the expansion of your language the expansion of 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 uh the concepts you have you literally cannot think you cannot grow your mind without words and that's why reading is such an a useful practice because it literally expands the contours of your mind your mind is wider, fuller, more expansive the more you read. And so as, as, he, as Prescott mentioned, we're moving back to hieroglyphics with the use of emojis. Absolutely. And this is part of the inability of, of people to think this is the broken brain syndrome. But again, Hermes is the god of both. He's the god of the, the emojis, of the, of the language, of, uh, of communication, generally speaking. And he's a trickster god. So a trickster god is always pulling tricks on you. And so as Hermes, again, the god of the information age, is pulling tricks on us with the techne. And that's the next thing that I want to point to is he's the god of art and technology. 
Hermes is the god of art and technology. And where have we existed in a point in which art and technology is more powerful than it is right now? I'm talking about art, Hollywood, movies, you know, the music industry with Cardi B and all this different stuff. Right? Art, the, the abstract expressionism, like this dumb, dumb art, like this low quality art actually prevents us from sort of seeing the transcendent realm of, of aesthetic, right? The good, the true, and the beautiful, to use the sort of uh, platonic trinity, if you will. The good, the true, and the beautiful. Contemporary art blocks us from these things on purpose because obviously they're trying to kill our soul, but it's like Hermes is playing a trick on us as a trickster deity, as a sort of coyote figure, right? And so I think it's really interesting. He's the god of art and technology. He's the god of science. God of science. So how interesting. We've never existed in a time in which scientism wasn't as authoritative as it is right now. Right? So again, the information age is the same age in which, well, science says so. But science doesn't exist by consensus. It exists by uh, you know, debate and, and argumentation and evidence. Well, the science says so. The CDC said so. The World Health Organization said so. And so ironically, in the name of science, the god of science, Hermes, uh, we see, again, a world in which science is expanding outside the contours of the scientific method and into a sort of religious phenomenon. And that was the last stream I did with Father Deacon on Gnostic scientism. It clearly has Gnostic scientific scientific. Scientist, you know, scientism has Gnostic elements that certainly are looking very religious and therefore, um, again, ironic, ironic that all this is occurring in the information age. Now, lastly, you know, um, I want to point out that Hermes is a god of magic and he's androgynous, just like Baphomet. So again, as we talked about how he's the god of boundaries, he's also an androgynous god, which shows that he's not good or evil. He's the combination of opposites. Now, I don't mean that he's not good or evil I'm, what, as a Christian. What I'm meaning is the people who follow Hermes don't see him as good or evil because he's a trickster figure. He's, he's sort of both in. He is, he is the circle that encapsulates both the yin and the yang, the bad and the good, the, the left and the right. And so he's not really either one or the other. He's sort of both. He's the trickster figure and he's the magician. And so at what point, again, I believe technology and, and the contemporary um, pursuits of technology is underpinned by a magical spirit. This is the basis of my PhD research is that I believe when you start to look into, uh, okay, let's look, look at the, the modern, you know, what's the contemporary foundations of the use of pills, for example, uh, you know, um, um, extracting what was believed to be the essences out of plants and putting them in capsules, Paracelsus. Well, Paracelsus was a German uh, hermeticist, magician, Christian, Kabbalist, all this different stuff, and and no doubt was he abs absolutely uh, impactful in his development of various medical processes. He also developed a laudanum, which is uh, the the sort of alcohol tincture of opium, a mixture of like eighty percent alcohol, say with twenty percent opium. It's then you can drink laudanum and you can become inebriated, and this was used for surgeries and all this different stuff. So Paracelsus was an essential sort of founder of contemporary medicine, but his main Focus was a hermeticist and an alchemist. And so we look at, uh, you know, what were the ancient alchemists interested in? Well, over in China, they wanted the elixir of immortality. And in the West, especially where we can look at the 16th century, the 1500s, it was all about the philosopher's stone. And the philosopher's stone was believed to be some mundane black rock that you could then do anything with. You could fly on it. You could, uh, it, it could protect you. You needed a shower, you hold it over your head, it'll, it'll shower. It could, is the magical stone. The philosopher's stone could do anything that the person who had the stone wished it to do. It's like a genie's lamp, but there's no genie and there's infinite wishes. That was the philosopher's stone. And that's what the alchemist was after. And often the magician, this is the basis for uh, John D and... Um, Edward Kelly in, in their adventures in, in Europe. 
And yet that's exactly what contemporary science is after. I mean, look at these digital technologies. Look at the transhumanism. Look at Silicon Valley. I just watched a video of Noah Harari talk about how over a billion dollars has been dropped into the pursuit of immortality within Silicon Valley. He's kind of, again, he, he's the sort of priest figure of the World Ec Economic Forum. But uh, Yuval Harari was talking about how, oh, yeah, absolutely, like uh, man's going to be redefined, so man's no longer going to be man in the biological and definitional sense he's historically been, which we've talked about before. But then he talked about how in Silicon Valley that he already knows that at least a billion dollars has already been dropped in the, in the last three years for the pursuit of immortality, and, Ju and Google is behind it. So Google claims that they've solved search, now they're going to solve death. And as a Christian, I find this horrific because the only way we enter into eternity is through that doorway of death. And, and what if what if Google and its sort of satanic yearnings actually wants to keep you in a state and prevent you from ever dying and pushing and, 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 and that is hell, right? It's like the opposite of, of freedom. They don't let you die and they put you in prison for the rest of your immortal life. It's the metaverse. It's, it's the satanic prison. It's hell. And so we already know that Silicon Valley is basically pursuing these sort of transcendental religious quests, right? The quest for immortality, the quest for omnipotence, the quest for omnipresence. They're already doing this. This is essentially a religious enterprise. This is essentially the basis of magic. And so I believe magic in its fullest sense, is absolutely being enacted out through the technology, which is, again, why Hermes is the god of the information age. It's not just he's the god of boundaries. It's not just he's the god of roads and travelers. It's not just thieves. It's not just athletes and commerce and the speed of communication and the god of writing and science and technology and trickery and magic. See, it's all these things together. It's, it's, the, it's the fields in which Hermes dominates that we then are being controlled by.